Good morning, everybody, and uh, it's great to see you all here at Bond University. What a great university it is. You're so lucky, Bond people. Amazing campus and amazing facilities. Um, my name's Kate Bardwell. I'm the chair of, of ANZREG, or ANZREG, however you want to say it. Um, I'm from the University of Otago, so uh, yes, my Kiwi accent is what you're going to have the pleasure of listening to all day. So um, I'll be moderating uh, all of the sessions today. And the first thing uh, I would like to do is introduce Ellen Finch. And Ellen Finch is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Students and Support Services here at Bond. And he's going to open our Ensridge 2019 conference. So just a brief introduction to Ellen. Uh, he's had a very long association with Bond University, apparently since the beginning. So, um, and they're, they're celebrating their 30th uh, anniversary this year. So Ellen has recently been conferred with an honorary doctorate as well. So uh, congratulations, Ellen. And can we welcome Ellen um, to our conference? Thank you, Kate. We're no strangers to Kiwi accents here on the Gold Coast, I might say. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we're gathered this morning, uh, the people of the Ugan Bear Language Group, uh, their elders past, present and emerging. Welcome to Bond and to this Australian and New Zealand uh, Regional Next Libris Group Conference. I actually got Sarah Fredline to unpack the acronym for me, uh, but we are delighted to have you here. Uh, I regard conferences like these as invaluable as they provide such a wonderful opportunity for the sharing of information, the sharing of war stories, and of solutions to problems, both within the context of the sessions you've no doubt got planned, uh, but also informally uh, over a meal or a drink or two, or perhaps several, yeah, if the experience has been particularly harrowing. One of the many good things about working in our sector is that there are regularly such events for groups who are performing similar roles across the sector. Uh, and it's a great way to get together and share information. Uh, but I suspect that you people in the libraries do this probably better than many of our other professions in our, in our sector. My brief this morning was to share something historical about our libraries with you. Uh, I can tell you that our main library, like all of our central academic buildings, uh, was designed and built before we had any students or academic staff. We did hire in some planning people uh, to give us advice uh, about basic collections that we should acquire to be ready to roll in May 1989 and to tell us about things like floor loadings and so on. Uh, which ironically now in our increasingly digital age are less important. Our law library was created from the original law school building Undercroft uh, because we had no law staff in place to tell us that any law school worth its salt must have its own library. The original assumption was that the law students might just manage to walk the 50 metres from the law building to the main library to access their collection. Our first law dean, however, wasted no time in correcting that unrealistic assumption. Our libraries have had benefactions from uh, the late John Carney QC and his wife Alison. Uh, John uh, is, was, uh, the late John Carney, I should say, uh, a very significant QC uh, and very wealthy man who lived nearby and uh, he was known affectionately by our law school as the godfather. Students these days call me the same, but for different reasons. I just make them offers they can't refuse. The libraries have uh, had a number of makeovers over the years, the most extensive and recent being the Law Library. Uh, no doubt your libraries, like, uh, like ours, have seen some of the former stack space being transformed into learning spaces for students. And uh, here at Bond, also under the umbrella of our library, is the Multimedia Learning Centre, uh, which is in converted gallery space and uh, has been in place now for something like a decade. Uh, it's still very popular with our students. The library annex, which extends south from the main library building, 
now houses our library staff and the vacated office space in the main library building has been turned into quiet study areas. And they're also in very high demand from our students. I'm told that Sue Hutley and Ian Edwards will be delighted to show you around our facilities in our campus uh, if you have some free time. I haven't seen the agenda, so that was perhaps a hopeful observation. I also understand that Naral Urquhart, a talented Aboriginal artist in her own right, and the Indigenous Engagement Advisor in our Nyambal Centre uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students will be offering a guided tour through our outstanding Indigenous art collection, much of which has either been donated or is on loan from Dr Patrick Corrigan AM. If you get the chance to do that, I recommend that you do so. Uh, enjoy your time with us and go for a ramble around the campus if you have some free time. Uh, we're very proud of Bond, as Kate has pointed out, it's, uh, it's an unusual campus in Australian terms because it has largely been built at the same time as a single entity. So there's been a genuine attempt to try and tie the buildings together in appearance and in functionality. And our students, if you see them around, are usually polite and friendly, although at the moment they're a little preoccupied because they have mid-semester exams. Welcome to Bond. Thank you, Ellen. Um, so I have some housekeeping things I need to do before I introduce our keynote speaker, and uh, it's quite a bit of housekeeping. Uh, so hopefully you remember half of what I've, I've got to tell you, and I'll try and keep it brief. Uh, so, the first thing I'd like to do is just introduce the Ansridge Committee. So I'm going to get all of the committee members just to stand up. Um, they're all spread throughout the room. And um, you'll see that we have special uh, yellow and blue ribbons to identify us. So if you have any questions through the conference, just feel free. We've got uh, Peter, Lynn, Amelia, Julie, Deborah, Stacy, and Megan. Uh, and they'll be happy to help you. Most of us, they, they should all know what's going on because we had a really good, really good debrief yesterday. So um, thanks, thanks to you all. And they have been fantastic in, in helping to uh, set up this, this conference. We have had apologies from Sue Harmer and Annette Shriver. They really regret that they can't be here um, with the rest of the committee, um, but they, they had urgent family business. So a few things, if there's uh, evacuation, if the alarms sound, um, which we really hope they don't. If you just follow the um, exit signs, I'm very pleased to say, hopefully, uh, we don't live in a country where the earth might shake. So uh, if the earth does start shaking, follow the Kiwis because they, they know what to do when there's an earthquake. Uh, if you're looking for the toilets, they're just out the, go out the doors that you came in and kind of veer around that way. I'm the most directionally challenged person and they've got me telling you where to go. So um, you'll see some signs there. They're out in that direction. Uh, if you're a smoker, there are places you can go to stand here, but it might be a bit early in the day for that. So, um, so Wi-Fi, hopefully most of you have managed to connect to either Eduroam or Wi-Fi, so the instructions are on sheets. Uh, you do need to enter your country code when you um, fill out the little online form. Uh, some of you will have meetings with Ex Libris staff, so uh, they haven't actually... Oh, yes, they have. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Amanda. Uh, so if you do have meetings set up with Ex Libris staff, uh, those meetings are in Building 1WC, so the entrance that you came in, if you carry on further up towards the campus, it's the next building that you come to, and if you go up the lift or up the stairs, it's on the next level. So uh, I think there's, there's probably some directions in the app that, that you can follow. 1C, yes. And uh, speaking of the app, hopefully you've all downloaded the app. Now, we've never had a conference app for Ansridge before, so this is pretty exciting, but we considered, given that um, Ex Libris have an app, we thought we'd better use it. So um, if you haven't downloaded it, uh, download it, and we've got be using um, lots of features on there to keep you engaged. The conference is mostly being live streamed, so which is fantastic. So it means we've got a much bigger audience than the people in the room. But we need to be really aware of those people that 
you can't really see. So we have to kind of stick to time as much as we can. And if you have questions, you're going to need to wait for the microphone because otherwise they're not going to hear and it's not going to be a great experience. And we are recording the sessions as well. So if you've got a burning question, if you could just wait till you get that microphone in your hand would be, would be really good. Uh, so I just want to mention our fabulous sponsors who are at the back of the room. So, and thank them all. So we have um, Third Iron, we have ProQuest aren't here yet, but they will be, um, ProQuest Syndetics, Research Professional, LapSafe and Library Help. So they're going to be here for the next two days and I really encourage you to make the, make the opportunity to go and talk to them. They're all very nice people and they're sponsoring various morning teas and events. So um, we thank you and it's great to have you participate in the conference. Uh, I also really want to thank our uh, presenters because otherwise we wouldn't be having a conference. So I really appreciate the people who are um, doing the presenting over the next three days at the conference and Dev Day and Best Practice Day. So thank you to all of you. Um, we are running very, very tight on time. So I will be sitting today in the front row and I'll be giving you kind of five minute and two minute notices. Um, so when you're getting close to the time, if you go over time, I'm gonna start kind of choking myself around the throat <laughs> and that's a sign that you need to wrap it up. So um, I'm, I'm hoping I don't have to get my theatrics out. Uh, so at the end of the day, we've got a little bit more housekeeping, but I think that's probably enough for now. And let's get um, into the, the business of the conference. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, keynote speaker for this morning, well, for the conference. And um, Professor Jeff Brand is here to do a presentation for us, Libraries at the Edge of Reality, a Manifesto for Civilization. Civilising Digitalisation. Thank you, Jeff, for that fabulous title that I almost managed to mangle. So, Professor Jeff Brand is a career academic in the discipline of communication and media with expertise in quantitative research methodology. He has an intellectual interest in policy for the digital economy, digital transformation and leadership in tertiary governance. He has quite a long bio here, and it's available on the app. So I'm going to let Jeff, <laughs> I'm going to let Jeff um, take it from here, and he's going to speak for about 45 minutes. And then we've got lots of time, hopefully, for some some questions. So over to you, Jeff. Thank you very much, Kate. And when you uh, said that uh, everyone was going to have to endure your uh, Kiwi accent, I thought, well, that's much better than enduring an American accent. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you very much for not reading all of that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to be here. Could I just acknowledge uh, the Kumbamere people of the Yugamba language group and pay my respects also to their elders past, present, and emerging in the spirit of reconciliation. Could I also acknowledge the committee uh, for uh, allowing me this great privilege uh, to speak with you uh, today, and could I also uh, just acknowledge the sponsors. I know that doesn't normally happen by a keynote presenter, uh, but I well rec recognize that uh, sponsoring a conference is very important. Um, and I have been looking forward to this talk for quite some time uh, because it's a bit of a folly. So just forgive me while I walk through a set of arguments uh, that also pays respect, I think, uh, to libraries and their civilizing influence. So here you have the Tianjin uh, Library. I don't know, if, have any of you seen this library? It was built two years ago, uh, launched, the front of the building looks like an eyeball. Uh, and uh, the center of it uh, pays homage to many other uh, ideas about libraries, which we will get to. Uh, now, my presentation will have lots of images, uh, and some of those images uh, will not have credits. And when they don't have credits, we just woke up, thank you. Uh, when they don't have credits, it means I've purchased this image, uh, and I've put the credits down the back. Otherwise, I've put the credits up. Uh, I want to say hello to Ansreg. And uh, let's get started. So the first thing you need to know is that I am quite an optimist. In fact, I'm almost a euphoric. Uh, uh, when I say I'm a quinquagenarian, it means that I'm um, holding on to my 50s as hard as I can. Um, but I'm also recognizing that I'm now in the better part of life. Because for quite some time, I was at the nadir, uh, according to the 
um, the proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences, research on uh, well-being and age, and psychological well-being being what it is, we know that it changes over the lifespan. I'm now climbing out. Uh, meanwhile, my students, of course, are descending in. So this is a great place for me to be. I'm really excited about life just at the moment. Of course, I'm really not uh, down at the bottom of the nadir. I think I'm always up here. And I'm going to give you some reasons why I, I feel uh, very privileged uh, to be a, a euphoric and to enjoy uh, all the bounties uh, of my life. Uh, I'm a parent, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But I, I really like and I abide by this principle uh, from Albert Einstein in his advice to his son, Edward. Uh, life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. And I think that's what libraries have always been doing. It's certainly what we as academics do in universities. Um, and it is, of course, uh, really the manifest destiny of humanity. Of course, I have the great pleasure of having been at great institutions. Uh, this is the Languages, Sciences, and Arts Building on the left from the University of Michigan, uh, one of my alma mater uh, you know, universities, and then, of course, uh, the clock tower at Michigan State University, both with phenomenal libraries, which I'll just talk about in a minute. I am a proud parent of three video game players. We'll move on. Um, and I uh, enjoy talking about technology, and particularly things like interactive media and games. And uh, I love doing things that are fun, like gamifying a keynote, as I did in Sydney one time, using Prezi and moving in and out and giving points. And it was chaos, but it worked, and we had fun. Um, I also do other really cool things, like build uh, the university with my students and my sons in Minecraft. Um, and there is a library, both the, the Bond University Library and then the library down underneath, which the server is now gone, uh, as ephemeral as these things are. Uh, so I can't show you, but it's this beautiful crystalline library in a cave underneath this, this uh, particular spot. spot. And we've um, talked about this in our own academic uh, work. But one of the things I really love is tension. I love juxtaposition. I love contrast. And when I think about the experiences I've had in the 25 years I've been in Australia, having married an Australian who uh, imported me, uh, so you can blame Jenny, uh, I love um, places like Wilpena Pound and the Flinders Ranges, and I love the ancient landscape of Australia. But I want to see it, of course, uh, from inside a Tesla. Not that I can afford one. Uh, but it, it's a great idea, isn't it? Sort of zipping through rough country in a very refined, presumably, vehicle. Um, so let's talk about libraries with that little backdrop. And I think Jay, you know, Jay Gatsby sort of trying to get some credibility and trying to get some purchase on reality in a very unreal 1930s crazy age, which is kind of where we are again, I think, um, is basically saying, you know, he might sober up by sitting in a library. And so I'm borrowing from his thinking a little bit and others, and you'll see this, uh, when I think about how libraries sit at the edge of reality. I think we're playing a lot with reality just at the moment, and we may be playing with fire. Um, but I want to create a bit of a manifesto, and it's a light manifesto, uh, around this idea. So um, here I am, the junior academic in terms of library sciences. I really don't know anything, so I can say anything. I'm kind of free in this regard. And I've basically promised uh, that we'll cover off on you know, preserving artifacts and um, um, civility. Uh, we'll actually uh, you know, facilitate discovery in the actions of search. Uh, we'll, you know, imbue uh, our technologies with our human values and will champion dynamic and diverse literacies uh, and um, uh, fluencies. So, of course, I like manifestos um, and I like the thought that we can take the changes in our society and bridge them uh, around these concepts where we build contracts and agreements. Um, I took some inspiration uh, from this book, which I have in my uh, Kindle library and have had for some time from O'Reilly Media, uh, which is a manifesto about the future of the book. Um, I also like uh, using digital tools uh, that allow me to explore the world in new ways, as we do, even though we uh, you know, like uh, the physical world as well. So this is a, a little application. I don't know if any of you have seen this. Uh, it's based on the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, it is called WordFlex, and it allows you to do little word clouds and understand etymology, uh, synonyms, antonyms, and of course, uh, definitions of uh, key words. So uh, in, in this case, OED, OED tells us that a manifesto is a public decora declaration of policy and, um, me there, yep. Uh, policy and, I don't know why that broke, and aims and objectives 
for an organization. It's interesting. Do we know why we've frozen? No? All right. So let's go on. In their book, um, Libraries and Society, uh, Baker and Evans talk about the library uh, as a key component, a pillar, if you will, in both developed and developing uh, societies. They basically argue that increasingly we're aware that libraries are important as tools for centering us and governing us and giving us purpose and place. And I like this where they say libraries are indispensable um, as they are, of course, uh, by their very nature, the conduit for the capture, preservation, and delivery, indeed the heritage uh, of humanity, the record of its triumphs and its failures, and of intellectual, scientific, and artistic achievements. Uh, this from an introduction by Tice. She says, their challenge in the role of libraries and librarians um, is that, of course, the world is dynamic and things are changing and digitalization is really changing the way we understand uh, the real and, the, and knowledge and our purpose. What I think is exciting about what I do as an academic, what you do as uh, folks who work in libraries is as professionals, you're confronting radical change. It's interesting, but it's also frightening. And so I think we need to ground ourselves. We need to ground ourselves in the real, we need to ground ourselves in traditions, and we need to be aware uh, that libraries uh, serve a fundamental and critical purpose uh, for our society. So I love this book, which I picked up through our own library, um, titled The Library, A Catalog of Wonders, uh, by Stuart Kells. Have you seen this book? Right. Uh, no? OK, so this, this book talks about the fact that um, libraries are full of objects, full of materials and, of course, of ideas through non-material interfaces. Bond University Library is one that wherever I go, I talk about the fact that it punches above its weight. It is very well governed. It is incredibly well resourced. Uh, not well enough from the chancellery to the library, but by virtue and dint of hard work, the library staff are amazing in making sure that our students and our staff get access to practically everything. And I love the fact that I can search for things and just grab them. Um, but what's really interesting about Kell's book is he says, you know, libraries can't hold everything. Libraries are not able to contain all of human knowledge. And he recounts uh, Jorge Luis Borges' uh, idea of the, the, the Library of Babel, in which uh, Jorge has actually had a, uh, uh, an idea that libraries would be um, potentially infinite if they could hold everything, and they could be perhaps hexagonal shapes uh, where lots of work uh, kind of echo uh, the sum total of knowledge of humanity. And architects and designers and artists have been sort of uh, warmed up by this idea of the Library of Babel, and they've been fascinated by it, and so they've created amazing uh, images to explain this idea of the Library of Babel. Notice this um, particular drawing uh, to the right, which sort of looks like the Tianjin Library, doesn't it? Um, and that sort of open space with this sort of sphere in the middle, which may be a sphere of a planet or uh, indeed the, the enclosure of the universe. But what's really interesting is computer scientists have built the Library of Babel. They've actually designed a place for scholars uh, to explore what happens if we had the sum total of all combinations of all characters known to humanity Ca captured inside a digital space, um, there would be 1.3 million characters. Right now, this particular tool, which is available online today, has, uh, what does it say, 3,200 characters, and that's the equivalent of 10 to the 4,677th power books, which is enormous, of course. Uh, and so what happens is, and this is a real thing, right, so everything is in here, if I type in uh, a particular phrase or set of words, I can actually find those words, I can find that phrase buried, either inside random characters that have been generated or indeed in random words in English. And there it is, libraries at the edge of reality stored somewhere in amongst English words in this massive data set of characters and words. Of course, that's depressing, isn't it? Because we know, therefore, there is no such thing as an original idea because it is all captured in this digital space uh, one way or the other. Thank you, Stephen Fry. 
So let's go back to Tianjin then, and let's deal with the notion of reality. Uh, you might have noticed that there are books everywhere in this library, but there are also the absence of books in certain shelves. Only certain shelves in this library have books. The rest are wallpaper. And from a distance, it looks like a beautiful sculptured space full of real books. But there's artifice in the thing, you see. And so we don't really always know what's real and what's not real until we get up close and personal with the thing. So again, defining reality and seeing if um, the iPad doesn't crash this time as we you go through WordFlex and sort of explore the idea, we can understand that verisimilitude, uh, likeness, tangibility, the ability to observe and reobserve separate from ourselves is the nature of reality. But reality, both politically and socially, is now up for grabs. And it's an unfortunate set of, of, affair, set of, uh, of, of events and state of affairs that leads us to this point. So this is my resource list for one of my classes connected to my Blackboard site. And just this week, I asked my students to read an article from The Economist from 2010 on a world of connections, a really beautiful summary piece of the nature of social media and showing the predictions about what was going to happen and that much of that has come to pass. What's really great about the resource list is, I, and I love images clearly, uh, is that uh, I can show the magazine or the book cover right inside my resource list. So my students can become aware of the physicality of the thing that is virtual in this space. The problem is, Boris Johnson was not the Prime Minister of England when that article was written, and he certainly wasn't on the cover of The Economist. This is the cover that should appear next to that article. Now, this is a work in progress like all things, but isn't it interesting that reality is up for grabs in digital space? Now, let's just pause there and recognize that we do not uh, have anywhere in the world the original manuscripts for any of Shakespeare's plays. We have only replications of them, right? So we don't really know exactly what he wrote. Voltaire wrote so many different versions of his works that his publishers just got frustrated, edited the work for him, and published it. Academics are always late to the party for deadlines. So we know that truth and reality is always you know, in flux. And isn't it interesting that as a culture and as a species, we're looking for space and verisimilitude and representation in digital environments like Minecraft. So here we have an individual. Uh, the person's identity is Fractal Curve. Thank you very much. I looked into it. I can't work out the real name of this person. Um, who wrote that he was inspired, or she was inspired, by the reading room at the University of Washington's uh, Susalo Library for the interior, and various University of Washington buildings for the exterior. Downstairs, this is the interesting thing, includes a card catalog. What? <laughs> and Carol's, okay, I can get that. And the head librarian's office, because you know structure and power are important. Um, and then the rare book room which is fabulous. So when we built Bond University in Minecraft, we actually had students build their assignments, put their assignments in books, put them in chests in the actual representation of our library, and allow people to open them up and read their work. It was fabulous. This is doable. But our buildings are really important. They're the places that structure us, the pl places that give us you know, permanence and resonance with our world. And so in this beautiful image of uh, the Parliament um, building and, and the, the Palace of, of Westminster, we find that, yes, what Winston Churchill said must be true. Buildings are shaped by us, and they shape us. And they're so very important. And so this is a building that shaped me. This is the University of Michigan Law Library Reading Hall. What a beautiful spot. What an amazing place to take my velo-bound, double-sided, double two-page up reading pack for one of my postgraduate subjects that I had to put M&Ms in to gamify the experience to get through the whole thing um, in that space. I also sometimes, just to mix it up, 
went to the reading room uh, in the Harlan Hatcher Graduate Library, which has beautiful stacks I'm going to mention in just a moment. But these spaces, I would argue, are absolutely necessary as we digitize everything and move content into uh, the ether. However ephemeral it is, we need something that is seemingly permanent. Of course, not everything is permanent, and even physical spaces are subject to ravages of time or uh, horrible mishap or human judgment. Uh, you are probably like me if you've ever been, uh, if, if you had the opportunity and the great pleasure and privilege uh, to be in a place like Notre Dame in Paris, you know how moving a space like this is and also how moving it is when that space suffers a calamity. It's amazing to me the reactions of people when this event happened. We were talking about it here for days. People talked about crying. You know, when my wife and I were watching it, we were, oh no, oh no, oh no. What is that reaction? It's a sense that something that is meaningful to us and represents our civilization is being torn away. And so my first argument, my first paragraph uh, and statement in the manifesto is that we have to preserve civility somehow, and that probably means we have to preserve artifacts. We have to pre preserve them in revered spaces, right? And these revered spaces have to stand strong as living, protective castles in which we try our very best to keep out the ravages of incivility. Indeed, in them, I think, we will find solace and grace. And so look at this beautiful, rich image and the security camera in the upper right-hand corner. In the digital age, of course, we can surveil. I'll come back to that. So here it is. This is the long room interior at uh, Trinity College in Dublin. It's a gorgeous space. Clearly, it has inspired generations of scholars, generations of students, generations of business people, and generations of parliamentarians probably hasn't inspired all of them just enough. And here is a copy of that space in Star Wars. And Peter Hopkins, thank you so much for that comment when I mentioned this to you. She said, is the brightness of the books the indication of how much they circulate? <laughs> Absolutely it is. And I would just point out some books these days in Australia, for example, get redacted. They're black, blackened out. We're not allowed to see them. But that in our fictions, we refer to our real world and our present is really interesting to me. And so Marshall McLuhan, one of the great media scholars, being a media researcher myself, I'm very interested um, in uh, thinking about how media evolve and change, once wrote that you know, no new medium Right, ceases to oppress its predecessors until it finds new positions for them. And I think the digital, and I think the imaginative uh, for a non-physical world is finding new places for the physical world. Have any of you seen this TED talk by Erin McKean? On, she's a lexicographer, I love that word. She loves it too and says it several times and says lexicography. It's something that really is an interesting concept, right? She says, when you improve searchability, you take away the one advantage of print, which is serendipity. Serendipity is when you find things you weren't looking for because finding what you are looking for is so damned difficult. But you know what? Search is difficult too, especially if librarians don't do their jobs. If the tools that they use and the digital backstop for all of our knowledge doesn't work the way it should. And so I love from this book uh, William, uh, by Williams, Golden, and Sweeney, this particular uh, chapter by Patterson talking about ESL students needing support in the library, needing to be um, given a kind of literacy and readiness for using the library effectively, for searching, for example. And so they actually talk, uh, uh, Patterson talks in this particular uh, chapter about helping students with their assignments and helping them with strategies. Sorry about that jitter. That looks gorgeous on a different screen. Uh, they, Patterson says, you know, to assist students in negotiating the obstacles of the research process, right, librarians offer instruction in information literacy. 
a broad concept enc encompassing finding, evaluating, and using information. And then she talks about various types of information literacy and the diversity therein. But what's really interesting is that as we move in through the 21st century, we're discovering that that literacy is something that can only happen, apparently, when we go and talk to other people, when we engage them, often very, very much so in a space that is that citadel, that castle where knowledge is harbored. Right? And so uh, in this particular piece by Josephine, uh, the, the idea is that uh, we understand that public libraries are changing what they do and why they do what they do to help improve the ease with which people can search. So this is how I used to search. This is the card catalog room in the Harlan Hatcher Graduate Library. You'll see there are um, tablet sort of um, pullouts where I can sort of pull out the, the space and then bring out the, the drawer, set it down, and search through the card catalog. This is now in the basement, apparently, of the Harlan Hatcher Graduate Library. And just on that very back um, card catalog uh, row, I lost a very nice pen once. You know, the physical does matter, especially if it's worth something to you. It was a gift. So these are the spaces in which we sometimes struggled with search in the past. But the past doesn't always keep up with the future. And this is a gorgeous Im image from the University of Georgia that I found uh, to basically reference uh, this article uh, by Dembski and Chapman talking about the experience with web content strategy, which serendipitously refers to the University of Michigan, which I thought was really fantastic. By the way, I lived in Georgia for seven years of my life. That kudzu is the nastiest stuff. It grows all over everything, including old buildings. Right? So in this article, right, Dembski and Chapman talk about the problem that, universi that university libraries in particular have had for so many years. Everything has to be kept. Everything has to be stored. And I love how Alan Finch mentioned the fact that the load-bearing capability of our own library is less of an issue now because we're not keeping everything. The problem with not keeping everything, of course, is, as you all know, and many of you have probably gone through this yourself, where you're getting rid of books because you need to be somehow less material and more mobile. Uh, you just don't know what to keep and what to throw out because it might all be valuable at some stage. But in this article, which really attracts me, uh, the challenge is discussed about moving from the physical and storing everything and all sorts of resources to the virtual and to the digital. And so this is fascinating, right? So they, are, they, they write that the, this huge library, which had six million volumes when I was a student there, right, had just so much content, uh, and it's distributed across 20-some library uh, uh, buildings, that uh, they didn't really know how to coordinate it as they moved online to digital. So you see things like roughly 10,000 pages of web content uh, were developed over time, living within and outside of multiple content management systems in the University of Michigan library system. 180 people across the library uh, building content, no governance, no structure. You probably all know this story, right? Uh, lots of different ways in do, for doing things, no real standards, no oversight. Indeed, they write that even the staff newsletter had more editorial oversight than the public-facing websites, uh, which were visited by 1.3 million people each year. Um, and they point out that uh, by doing this, by having lots of diverse content, by not knowing how to govern the digital, because we'd already worked out through a card catalog system and the Dewey Decimal System, for example, that we can actually store content in really uh, flexible ways, we're in trouble. Because the signal-to-noise ratio from digital stuff that we need to digital stuff that we don't need was very high. So they talk about, in this article, the loss of trustworthiness and credibility. And I remember when they brought in a green phosphorus monitor where you could actually search the text of the card catalog at the time, this is 1989, um, at the University of Michigan uh, Harlan Hatcher Graduate Library. And what they point out in this article is that as we did all of this migration, it bifurcated, it broke up, it spread, and was atomized. And pretty soon, uh, the costs and the management challenge was enormous. So this is a stack that I am familiar with uh, vaguely from my memory. Uh, from the Harlan Hatcher Graduate Library. And these were proper stacks. You could go walk through planks, look down between the 
floor and the books and the shelves, and you could actually see the next level down. It was basically scaffolding flooring uh, of the shelves, not shelves on floors that were load-bearing. The shelves themselves bore the entire load of the work. What I loved about being in these spaces was, one, I knew where not to go because that's where all the lovers on campus went. And I just browsed books, as we do. It's harder sometimes in a digital library to browse because, of course, algorithms give us recommendations and prevent us from enjoying our serendipity. So my second manifesto point, I think we need to promote understanding and wisdom through knowledge. We have to facilitate the joy of discovery, the actions of search. We've got to help one another, our students, our customers, uh, academics. We need to help everyone understand that you don't always find what you're looking for. Sometimes you weren't looking for what you needed to find. And that's really important. And to the extent that digital makes it too easy, or is too pointed now because we're getting really good at digital management, it seems to me that we run the risk of forgetting you know, serendipity. What McKean said was this beautiful discovery of something because you couldn't find what you were actually looking for. And see, what happens when we get angry and frustrated, or we don't know and we don't have knowledge and we don't have wisdom, is we swear and we abuse and we berate. So Oscar Wilde was onto this, right? And here we have now, of course, uh, what's happening in the um, parliament in the United Kingdom. Right? And to do these things, to teach the English how to talk, to help the Irish listen, to help, you know, our society becomes civilized. We need libraries to teach temperance, flexibility, but also permanence of space. How many of you have uh, had a look at Ginger Gorman's uh, Troll Hunting? Great Australian journalist, just published this book last year. It is chilling to the bone. Um, it's surprising and then not to me that professors are trolls online, interestingly. QCs politicians. When we think about civilization and we think about civilizing, of course, what we really have to understand is that we're talking about enlightenment. We're talking about patience. We're talking about being ladylike or gentlemanlike if we're going to gender it. We're talking about also uh, being courteous and well-mannered. And that only happens, I think, through patience that comes from exploring and sort of absorbing knowledge. Oh, uh, Gorman, in her book, talks about several things. She talks about Australia's e-safety system, which is fascinating. And I do work for the classification board uh, here in Australia. And uh, they work tightly with e-safety because, of course, uh, the stuff that gets classified now evolves and changes over time. Games, for example, are online. Movies are now updated. And Netflix has an algorithm uh, that causes enormous problems for them. Uh, it turns out that, um, for example, um, Netflix, if it sees a shirtless male, automatically classifies that as uh, MA15+, which is ridiculous. Um, but uh, there we are. Algorithms are in control. She also talks about the fact that algorithms may be needed uh, for us to promote civility. The problem is if we let algorithms tell us what to do, we're probably ceding our very souls and our control over the digital and ourselves. And so, of course, uh, in the conversation, uh, my colleagues um, up the road at QUT and University of Sunshine Coast have written about the fact that we need to improve the way we train for tolerance. And that training, I believe, involves a lot of reading, a lot of engagement in civilized spaces, and working with civilized people, professionals like you. Their argument is that work's becoming more ambiguous, like everything else, because it's becoming more ephemeral. It's becoming somehow less structured. And as a result of that, particularly in advanced knowledge work, people are getting frustrated um, in their jobs and they're taking it out on each other. Sherry Turkle, in her book, Alone Together, said that we seem determined to give human qualities to objects and we seem content to treat each other as things. It's really interesting, is it, isn't it, that this device, this thing, the mobile phone, is just so plentiful and that people are in it all the time 
talking to each other, sure, but also talking past each other, walking past each other, actually not engaging one another in the, per, in, in the, in the physical space that they're in. Jaron Lanier coined the term artificial reality. He's from the um, uh, 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 University of California at Berkeley. He's very concerned that social media are not advertising supported. He says that social media are actually supported by organizations seeking to change behavior, behavior modification on a global mass scale. And he says the way they're working is they're creating an outrage machine that holds people's attention for as long as possible on a given platform. And this outrage machine is increasing our incivility. People are spending too much time in social media and not enough time in libraries, he says. Fascinating. And of course, we know that our mainstream media are also facing a crisis, although this, uh, I think the best thing that um, both um, uh, Brexit and Trump have done for journalism is it's sort of caused a rebirth. We have more students interested in our journalism program all of a sudden, for example. But I mean, really, um, this is a gorgeous image, right, created by an artist and a real, so artist Jessica Savage Brower. Um, she's a real tr Trump critic, and here uh, she's photoshopped Trump um, during the floods in Texas, uh, handing out a hat, uh, a mega hat, uh, to somebody who really just needs a hand into the boat. Um, because he's helping. Um, and so it's obviously satirical, and it's meant to also criticize the fact that fake news is a very real problem, um, and deep fakes are a bigger problem. So if we look, for example, at academic writing on social media and society, um, exploring whether or not our mobile social media are making us less civilized, we see a number of essays that say, yes, that seems to be the case. There's certainly evidence for the fact that people increasingly seem to be frustrated with one another and impatient with one another, and they're always looking for things that upset them because, of course, um, they're looking for the dopamine hit that Jaron Lanier talks about in his book, which I commend to you, although that title of the book is, is quite cumbersome, of course. Um, and so I like this from Wilson Mitzner, uh, this idea that you, know, you need to be nice to people all the time. And when I talk to Siri, I always say please and thank you, even though I know you really don't need to. But I think at some stage, Siri will appreciate it. And I will appreciate the fact that Siri treats me better than people who say, you know, ask Siri to say naughty things or whether or not she's interested in having a date. Um, and I'll just degender this now. Siri, of course, can be a male. And Siri can be a Kiwi or an Australian or an American. I have to say the Australian female Siri is the most attractive. But then that's sort of kind of my marriage history as well. So we need to be nice to people. And it's interesting that people are being antisocial so much because according to my favorite rag, The Economist, in which nothing is sacred, um, we are being spied on increasingly. Right? And if I just take AI spy and we talk about people in their jobs, we know that employers and indeed employers looking for future talent are spying on their workers and on their future workers, right? And so if we're being spied on and everything we're doing is being recorded, and indeed we're geolocating ourselves every moment of the day, isn't it amazing that we're happy to take out uh, and, and mete out justice on people uh, through social media when we uh, are feeling upset? And so here's the rub, too. Um, we're allowing our machines to guide our behavior, and we're ceding control. So we know, for example, that there are a number of algorithms that organizations like Netflix use to guide our consumption. Our libraries increasingly are guiding our consumption. Amazon, for years, has been guiding our consumption. And in this book by um, Bradford Eden, in the first chapter by Laura Magnuson, the idea that libraries are moving to predictive analytics, using business intelligence, BI, right, to understand more about patrons, to work out how to manage collections, indeed, to build a better business for the patrons and customers of libraries, we find that libraries all of a sudden are faced with enormous ethical challenges. I'm pretty sure that my library knows how little or how much I use it. I'm not sure P 
people in the library do, but I know that we have data sitting back behind everything that we do in the library, and that there are some real important decisions that we must make as we build algorithms into driving, for example, our student behavior, um, or our academic behavior, or our scientists' behavior in our research organizations. This is priceless, of course. And as we build data around things that we do, we know that we don't always know what to do with the data or how to use it wisely. Many of you will have read uh, Yuval Noah Harari's works. Um, the Brief History of Humankind is Panoptic. Um, the better of the two for me is um, his book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. He says, humankind is losing faith in the liberal story that dominated global politics in recent decades. He writes, exactly when the merger of biotech and infotech confronts us with the biggest challenges humankind has ever encountered. And so we know we can manipulate one another. We know that we can be rude to one another, but we also know that we're being manipulated. What kind of trust machine are we living in? And so in this particular book, right, this is probably the most important takeaway and one of the things that libraries need to do for all of us. It's a big ask. It's probably more than the mission that you thought you might have signed up for when you went into your profession. But Harari says, you know, we need to know ourselves. You know, know yourself, because if you don't know yourself, we can guarantee that Netflix will know you that Google will know you, that YouTube knows you. And you already know, and you've had conversations with students, those of you who are front of house, where you've said, you know, the reason you can't find what you're looking for is because your Google algorithm already knows that you don't normally look for stuff that is intellectually enriching, right? You're looking for rubbish, and that's why you're not finding much, because the algorithm is not letting you in, right? So libraries, it seems to me, have to meet a challenge of helping us re-engineer the way we think. And so a book that I talked to my students about by Freshman and Selinger, uh, Re-Engineering Humanity, um, is, has been much applauded by a number of, uh, shall we say, um, digerati who love talking about the risks and the benefits of digital. For example, Douglas, Rufko, Rush, R Douglas Rushkoff, I don't know if any of you saw his, um, uh, um, the Internet in American Life series on, um, uh, public television several years ago, it was about six years ago, it's absolutely rich with ten sections of information that are uh, uh, thoroughly beautiful. Um, but he also uh, has a book on, um, it's called Pro, uh, Program or Be Programmed, and it's basically a manifesto, if you will, for uh, working in the digital age. But he says that um, uh, uh, Frischman and Selinger's book uh, will convince you why it's so important that we embed technologies with human values before they embed us with their own. Others, like Astra Taylor, have, has, have written that what's lost uh, when we outsource our decision making to algorithmic systems that we don't understand and we don't own. Or the idea that we transfer agency to computers and software, and as we do this, we also begin to cede control over our desires and our decisions. I love this image, which I purchased for another talk a few years ago. Um, many of you will be aware of the idea of the technological singularity um, in which, at some stage, machines and humans will merge, and machines will be as smart and as capable and then exceed human capability. This is a physical representation of that, and it's grotesque for many, but it represents the real challenge we have. As we move more and more digitally, we have to accept that we are embedding us ourselves into a digital world and a digital space. And so my third argument and my third charge in this manifesto is that to use increasingly intelligent technologies safely as we pursue our destiny, we must imbue our technologies with human values, borrowing from those many ideas, including Harari's, uh, that we have to know ourselves so that we are not better known by our machines. So the world population is increasing. We know that in the next five years we'll cross eight billion people. We know uh, that population increase is actually declining, so the rate of the increase is declining. But we have a fairly good idea that within the next hundred years we'll cross 11, 12 billion people. 
We also know that the planet, with all of these people, is covered by mobile phones. I love this 2015 cover from The Economist. The planet of the phones, arguing that by 2020, 80% of adults will have a supercomputer in their pockets. And they do very clever things, as The Economist does, phono sapiens for a heading. And they talk about the fact that um, these smartphones will be going everywhere. As many of you know, India right now has a project to make sure that 90% of Indians have a smartphone by the end of next year. And they're about $20 each. And yes, they run on Android, and they're definitely not Apples. But in this beautiful Economist article, we have some really interesting takeaway charts. For example, the number of mobile broadband connections in the billions leading up to 2014 only, the decline in the cost of data, and the increase in those connections, and look at the developing world in the light blue there on that left-hand graph, right? Overtaking the developed world in new connections. In the second graph, mobile data transmitted in the exabyte range, right? Every year, up to 2019, the projection forecast there from 2015 to 2019, because this article was published in um, early 2015. North America at the bottom, Western Europe, Asia Pacific, and then the rest of the world. The world's population is growing very quickly. And they're getting online. Again, it's predicted that 80% of adults around the world will have a smartphone. Solid lines are real. The dotted lines or the dashed lines are projections. You know, Asia Pacific approaching uh, North America and Western Europe by 2023. And this is a great book. So formerly an Indian from Chennai, um, Payal Arora, uh, in his book, The Next Billion Users, talks about digital life beyond the West. Because let's be real, everything that we do um, in our libraries here in Australia and in New Zealand uh, is basically about the West. And it's about Western technology. But we already know that China is driving a lot of the thinking around how we use technology in the West. Facebook is trying to develop a currency so it can have the same thing as WeChat in China. But it can't. So the next billion users will determine where we're going to go with the internet. And people who are interested in economic development are really interested in what people in the developed world will do with the mobile phone, that supercomputer in their pocket. Lamentably, they're not going to be visiting the library. They're going to be playing video games and they're going to be on social media. And it's interesting that we in the West have values about that, right? So um, Aurora says, this is a double standard, because we like to play, we like to have fun, we like to be entertained. People in developing countries will go onto their mobile phones and go onto the internet to play streaming games and to be involved in the same social media that is a rage machine in the West. They will, however, become increasingly digitally literate. And many of them, yes, will play video games like Fortnite, which, to be sure, um, is not the very best thing that um, video game companies have ever produced. It creates dopamine hits with a very precise schedule uh, that entrains people into its system all of the time. Nobody at my house plays this bit of digital crack. But this is where we're headed. Again, the algorithms understand when we need the hit, and they're going to hit us with just the right amount of pleasure or challenge to create a dopamine hit. And big companies like Facebook, which if you look at the Forbes 2000 list of publicly listed companies, continues to ascend the ladder, is now in the top 80, right, is taking over digital spaces, including virtual reality a place where libraries could play an enormously powerful role for helping people observe, search for, engage with a whole variety of different stimuli uh, related to their interests. But instead, Facebook and its CEO is really the only organization not blinding itself or blinkering itself in this room with virtual reality goggles. And Walt Disney, I, you know, you have to like these sorts of quotes, right? says we have to keep up with the times, we have to keep changing. And the fact of the matter is, 
that despite the fact that we have some of the most beautiful buildings, these citadels, these castles in which to preserve content and artifacts of civilization. And I mean, it really is just gorgeous, right? The Latrobe Reading Room. The first time I entered this space, you could see that I just had a spiritual moment like I had when I was at the University of Michigan. The reality is libraries are having to change and you know it. But the way they're having to change isn't really quite yet written because as more and more people come and as more and more people have a digital literacy that differs from our own, for example, they are engaged game players, they are engaged social media users. Um, that idea of a library as a public good, its ubiquity in the developed world will actually contain a certain sting because if we look at from this article by Darnton, which was written 11 years ago, which I found a couple of months ago when I was thinking about this talk, tells us that from writing to creating the codex was a 4,300 year journey. From the codex to movable type was a 1,100 and a bit year long journey. From movable type to the internet was a 524 year journey. From the internet to search engines, a 19 year journey from search engines to Google's algorithmic relevance ranking, seven years. Netflix, you may be interested to know, um, has a monitoring system of the world's internet. It makes it publicly available. You can go onto their site and actually toggle different countries and compare your country, for example, Australia, with other developed countries like New Zealand. And we'll find that, New, that Australia lags behind New Zealand. And Netflix wants its viewers to know that because it has a commercial interest in every country having good broadband. You can even look at your different providers and you can discover that in Australia, Telstra definitely does dominate the game in terms of speed and connections. Libraries have to do the same thing. They have to start monitoring where things are coming from and where capacities are. This is the cardinal sin of presentations, right? Don't put up a, a screen of text. But I do want to, and I, I've, I've sort of tightened it up a little bit, but I just, just do want to acknowledge this. So the students in the 1950s, right? For them, libraries looked like citadels of learning, kind of my point. Knowledge came packaged between hardcovers, and a great library seemed to contain all of it. Modern or postmodern students, of course, do most of their research at computers in their rooms. To them, knowledge comes online, not in libraries. They know that libraries could never contain it all within their walls because, of course, information, presumably, is endless. And we know that from the Library of Babel that this is potentially true. So I like this idea that this knowledge this information extends everywhere on the internet, and to find it, one needs only a search engine, not a card catalog. But this, too, may be a grand illusion. Or, to put it positively, there is something to be said for both visions, the library as a citadel and the internet as an open space. The great challenge is navigating that space. So Clay Shirky, uh, a man who is, can only be described as a techno-optimist, in his book, Here Comes Everybody, says, the population of the world will be online. And as it goes online, we will need multiple languages, multiple literacies, both digital and analog. And so the last point, to survive the 21st century, we must embrace population growth and diversity, which means, of course, our libraries have to handle more traffic. We have to embrace both digital and analog. And I think this will require us to champion very dynamic ways of understanding diversity, diverse literacies, and diverse fluencies. And I love images like this, right? They are, at the end of the day, techno-optimistic. A woman holding a phone, clearly empowered, clearly enabled, clearly literate, clearly scaffolded. But what this doesn't show is how important libraries were to get her to this point. So I have a couple minutes left. Maybe we could have a conversation. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for um, such a fabulous start to our conference. I mean, there's some really, really challenging 
ideas and concepts that we really need, need to think about. Um, for myself, it was great to see the card catalogues. I think probably half the people in this room have I don't know if they ever use them. Maybe they've seen them as... Uh... Hands up, have you used a card catalogue? Okay. Oh, that's great. But I would just point out there is a certain age quality. There is, yeah. I'd say most of the young staff at, at our library um, see them as wine racks because a lot of the staff grabbed them when they were getting rid of them and they make great wine racks. So, um, okay, now that yeah. is a civilising yeah. function of a card catalogue. <laughs> But um, um, for me, I think the importance of serendipity, that was fabulous mm. to hear you talking about that, because I think, you know, we create these fabulous discovery systems and we remove, in a way, that opportunity for serendipitous discovery and learning. So that is great to hear you talking about that, and it's definitely something that we've been talking about um, at Otago. Um, the real concerns about the, the dopamine fix from social media, and I've never heard that, that term digital crack, but that really did resonate mm. quite strongly. Um, I'm going to be polite to Siri, so thank you for that. <laughs> you never know what might happen, but uh, I don't actually engage yes, with Siri a lot. Um, but I think there's a lot of things that I can't cover and wrap up, but um, I would like to open it up for some questions. And we've got some microphones circulating, uh, circulating, so if you want to put up your hand, and Peter's going to sprint around the room. Um, can I ask that, if you have a question, can you just say your name, um, so that it's just easier to answer a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Personalise them. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just say while you're um, winding up, uh, I'll make these available, these slides, because there's a lot of resources in them you may want to interrogate. So is this, this working? Okay. <laughs> oh, I have the microphone, and I had a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my name's Amelia, I'm from RMIT, and your, your talk covered a lot of the, the social media and the dangers of it, and the thought that that next billion people uh, that are going to sort of direct maybe the future mm. are possibly not even going to be in libraries. So if social media is potentially a dangerous space to be, but I is it a space that libraries should be in if that's where people are? Mm. Amelia, I think that's a great question. I'm, I'm, I've started quitting social media. That sounds like a strange way of saying it, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm basically, I've kept my accounts, but I'm, deci I'm not posting. I'm trying to wind myself away. I think I'm, I'm convinced that there is a real danger in social media. I don't think the current platform that uh, social media operate in uh, will continue. I think, obviously, Europe is on the move uh, here to sort of regulate it, um, and the ability to just put anything on video, including horrific, uh, events, uh, for example, in Christchurch, uh, tell us that social media are deeply problematic. I think libraries have a, have a role to play there, but not being a librarian, not being perhaps as creative as most of the people in this room, um, I would say I really don't have an answer. If I could, I would simply offer uh, that if we populate social media with more history, with more reference, with more evidence, with more citations, uh, if we just document and, and demonstrate that knowledge comes from different places and that we're all inspired by different sources rather than every one of us has an original idea, then I think we would be in a better space. I think that would shift the registers enormously. I think what's on social media should almost always be referenced. So you're talking about libraries playing a fact-checking role on Absolutely. social media maybe? Absolutely. And, and anything a library and, and its staff uh, post online should sort of, I think, be reverent, not irreverent. Thank you, Amelia. That's great. Uh, hi. I'm Megan from Monaco University. Um, I was going to talk to Kate's pickup on your um, idea of the serendipitous discovery of information. Um, we're doing a talk later um, in the conference. Um, our core discovery tool has a, a number of functions that promote serendipitous mm. information discovery, which users just don't use at all. And I'm interested to know your thoughts on that. Megan, I can't speak exactly to the tool only because I don't know about it either. And I guess that's the key question. How do we sort of hoist the flag and let people know that these tools are sitting there ready for them to, to use? Um, I think, you know, I mean, I use a lot of tools, and I like exploring new things. Um, I don't mind, I mean, if I get lost on a desert island, I will definitely take my two-volume um, Oxford Shorter um, English Dictionary, because it'll occupy my time every day. Uh, but 
those tools, and I love the serendipity that's in it, but those tools clearly um, are things that people aren't just aren't finding, and I think we've got to just drive them there, right? We've got to say, and, and but but listen to what I'm saying. I don't, when I'm in the middle of my workflow, have time to be serendipitous. I've just got to find what I need to find. Yep. And our students have that sense of agency and purpose and direction as well. And I think this is part and parcel uh, of our digital and our I guess, productivity culture um, in the current sort of you know, version of digital capitalism in which we exist. We've got to get things done. We've got to get it done quickly. We've got to be efficient. Mm -hmm. We've got to be right. We can't play which is a real problem. Uh, of course, I have the best job in the world, and I had so much fun putting this together because I could just play. I, had, I, I didn't quite meet the brief exactly, but I just did what I wanted. <laughs> so yes, uh, just, we've got to let people know that that exists and that serendipity is good and discovery is good, Megan. Um, excuse me. Uh, my name is my name is Paul. I'm from Macquarie. Thank you for your most inspiring talk, and, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I just want to um, ask, uh, probably sharpen a little bit, because I really enjoy your, 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 your perspective on patience um, and its co relationship with our struggle of not finding anything, and, to, and that struggle, you link that to uh, create uh, civility, in a sense. Mm. Would you mind to give us a little bit more on that? Because you mentioned the word gentleman. Hmm. And not so long ago, I, we, we read about, say, John Henry Newman's idea of university. And hmm. we know the word scholarship in Greek means leisure. Hmm. Um, but, and I just heard you about talking about digital capitalism and in contrast with the postmodern. Hmm. And how, how would you encourage the librarians or the students um, to, to highlight that patience is a way of building knowledge and wisdom rather than speeding it up? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but I just thought you might want to help us to engage a bit more on that. Thank I, you. I love the way you frame your question, Paul. I mean, I think we think a lot alike. You know, we sort of try to pull several different important threads together to weave a, a beautiful blanket, right? Uh, and this blanket should cover us uh, with a kind of knowledge and an understanding. If you asked your question of me, and I was in my phone the whole time you were asking me, how would you feel? You would feel as though I were disregarding you or I was breaking my attention. But I was focused laser-like on what you were asking me. And when I work with my students, and I see my colleagues in the library work with our students, and we do have, I have to say, uh, a really privileged position here at this institution because we only have 4,300 students. We have the leisure of not massifying their own existence, whether it's in the library or in the classroom. But it is just so incredibly important, even online, to focus laser-like on our engagements with one another. Patience and indeed the joy of discovery can come from sitting down and slowly interrogating uh, the question you're being asked. I think civility comes from patience with others and understanding that they may not exactly know what they're looking for, and we may not either. One of the biggest problems I have with working at a university is that um, oftentimes we think we must know, but the reality is, of course, knowledge is fleeting and it's only generalizable for the moment that we're existing. So we have to understand that we should just pause, listen to one another very carefully, and online patiently unpack what people are telling us. Um, you know, the, 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 I think the speed with which we uh, think we know and think we understand and then respond to one another is part of the danger and part of the incivility with which we operate. And I think libraries, for me at least, and I, one of my best memories uh, was sitting in my undergraduate library at a place called uh, Grand Valley State University, which was a, a place of 5,000 students, a liberal arts college, and reading a book from front to back in a quiet corner by a window looking out at the snow. Uh, it was a moment of transformation for me. 
And when I then went and asked for a book that we didn't have in the collection, the librarian spent a lot of time with me actually connecting up other works as well. And it was, I have to say, that reading and that engagement that said, I'm going to graduate school. So you can't put a price, I think, on you know, close engagement with one another. Um, and as more and more people enter our library spaces, and they come from many different cultures, uh, this university, um, like most Australian universities, has a very large population of both Indian and Chinese students. We also have a large population of Norwegians, uh, but there you go. Uh, we, we have to understand that they see things perhaps differently and we have to work patiently with them. And I think that's just so critical. I don't know if that really answers your question, but it provides you, I guess, with a potential recipe for uh, re-engaging and re-civilizing. Thanks for very much, Paul. Okay, we've probably got time just for one more question. Okay, well, I would very much like to thank Jeff. We have a small gift for you, Jeff. So. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so much. It's great. And um, will you be around for morning tea? For, yep, so Jeff will be around for morning tea if you've got any conversations you want to have. Um, and so just a little bit of... of more housekeeping. Um, it's really just a thank you and acknowledgement to Research Professional for sponsoring the morning tea. So um, the staff are at the back of the room, so if you get a chance, go and have a chat to them. Uh, obviously chat to each other because that's what we're providing these kind of reasonable breaks for, uh, so that you can get a chance to talk to each other and, and get to know each other. So we'll be starting back at 11 o'clock. Thanks. It's like, oh God, is this going to work? Thank you.